we've officially reached the age where we're getting old. Yeah. For two reasons. First one is... So picture the scene. We've got a country that's probably lost half its population. We've got... <laughs> Kay and I found ourselves the other day talking for some time about general ailments. <laughs> Turn to the strictest and most devout monastic order, probably. <sighs> oh, yeah. What is the abbreviation? TLDR. What does that mean? I don't know. No idea. I'm Too his... long, didn't read. Too Pardon me, boy, is that the Chattanooga Choo Choo? Yeah. Track 29? Yeah. Oh, won't you give me a shy? Brian is like, do you not know what that means? No. No. Because we speak. <laughs> Everybody to the Bakery Bears video show featuring the rise and fall of the monasteries. Yes, indeed. Yes. Last year, we produced what was an epic series on Hadrian's Wall. And over seven episodes, we told the story of the wall and in turn, the story of England from the building of the wall to, well, never really was destroyed because it's still there now. It's still there. Bits just, of it still just there. Just stopped being used. Oh, wouldn't it be amazing if it was still there as it was, 20 feet tall? <laughs> That'd just be Don't start awesome. talking about walls, Kate. Oh. That's a bad idea. <laughs> I just mean from a historical point of view, just a little bit of it. So, 1900 years, that is what it was last year. It was his 1,900 year anniversary. That's hard to say. It was its 1900th year anniversary. It's the whole reason why we did it. Seven wonderful episodes, and the whole reason why I'm bringing this up is today marks the seventh episode of The Rise and Fall of the Monasteries. Last year, the series was coming to a close, mm. but yes, at the Bakery Bears, we always like to push the boundaries. Mm. So this year, there's another three episodes. There's nine episodes nine. in the series. Yeah. Oh my yeah. goodness. So yes, today, seventh episode in the series of The Rise of the Monsteries, and today is a big day because it marks the beginning of the end. Yeah. It's like a three-episode arc. The fall tells, is coming. Yes, yes, yes. And it's wonderful, actually, in this episode to sort of start to see mm. the historical triggers which brought about not only the fall of the monasteries, but also the birth of the country which we live in now. Mm. And when you consider the fact that, you know, it's a whole other <laughs> whole other conversation, the British Empire, but obviously that spread across the world, the implications from this episode mm. are global ones. We've officially reached the age where we're getting old. Yeah. For two reasons. First one is, Kay and I found ourselves the other day talking for some time <laughs> about general ailments. <laughs> it was, you know... A, a no, it was really funny. It was a perfectly genuine conversation. It was. You know, yeah, a deep, yeah. deep in conversation. <laughs> and <laughs> That's the moment, isn't it, where you realise, when, when you meet someone and you start talking to them and actually uh, yeah. all you're doing is comparing aches, pains. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and I, it was I just suddenly hilarious. said to you, didn't I? I said, oh, gosh... We've Have you seen what we're doing? We've officially got this old This is what now, it's right? like when you get old, isn't it? Yes. You talk about things like this, and we just had a good laugh about it. But then the next moment came when we were playing... And the funny thing is, it wasn't even a question in Trivial Pursuit, the, the, the whole question about the band leader. Oh, no, that's right. I was just sat there trying to think of... Now, here's a question for you, ladies and gentlemen. Could you please tell me the name of the famous band leader who was responsible for things like Pennsylvania 6500? Yeah. Pardon me, boy, is that the Chattanooga Choo Choo? Yeah. Track 29? Yeah. I want you to give me a shy. I'm guessing you're all shouting his name at the top of your voice. Could Kay and I remember his name? No. And Kay loves this band leader. I love him. To the point of... We could remember the film with Jimmy Stewart. Yeah. We could see the poster yeah, with yeah. the blank, blank story written on it. I think he's even sort of stood on the side holding onto I a trombone with his glasses. I think he is. I'm sat yeah. there and over the course of the next hour, I'm throwing out names we, of all the band leaders yeah. other than this person. Tommy we, Dorsey, we Sid Lawrence. We absolutely refuse to Google it yes. because we 
when we can't remember something these days we try to use our brains and we're like no don't google it it's the worst thing you can do yeah. because your brain stops using the fun- that function you know that's what your brain's there for and in in the in the words of one of our most beloved patrons i don't want to say a name because I don't, I don't want to embarrass her but okay one of our beloved patrons once said to us if you don't use it you will lose it yeah and she's also an extremely powerful medical doctor. She is. So I tend to trust... We do trust her. ...this particular person. Yes. Everyone is on the edge of their seat. How did we remember the name of Glenn Miller? Glenn Miller. Well, I'll tell you what we did. You were all shouting it. We finished our game of Trivial Pursuit, which is a whole other story, because we got trounced by our daughter, but I suppose we should have done, considering she's doing her A-levels. But anyway, we got trounced by our daughter... There were some dreadful it's questions. It's because we were playing the sort of up-to-date questions. Well, up-to-date, those questions are at least 10 years old. That's up-to-date. It is. We are, from That's now really on... That's really up-to-date. We refuse to play anything other than the questions from the late 80s the or the 90s. The original questions, yes. which we've got. Yes, yes we and do. And we're like, right, we're not playing this again unless we get the original questions and Bryony can have them on. Because the questions were idiotic. Order. One of them was, what does the... Is it abbreviation? It is, isn't it? Oh, yeah. What is the abbreviation TLDR? What does that mean? I don't know. No idea. And Brian Too long, didn't read. Too long, didn't read. And we're like, me and, me and Dan are like, what? what? And Brian is like, do you not know what that means? No. No. Because we speak. <laughs> don't. We say words. Yes. Not which abbreviations. Is, no. You know, teenagers don't really speak in full sentences, I, I don't it's think, It's not anyway. just teenagers anymore. Well, but look, no. how did we get to Glenn how Miller? Did we, how did we? I'm telling you, I'm right here, but Kay insists that we're not. I said, right, get a piece of paper and write down the underscore underscore story. As if we were playing <laughs> hangman or something. <laughs> and then I started throwing out names to fit in. And then suddenly, I think it was you thinking about the actual music. Yes. You suddenly went, I've got it. Glenn Miller. It just suddenly Whoa. it just suddenly came to me. We were thrilled though. And so much better, like you say, to do it that way. Yeah. Than then just to not use your brain and yes. just Google it, you know? Brain power is the way Because forward. your brain is a better computer than the oh, it is. Google will ever be. Absolutely. Yeah. Certainly is than than Siri. <laughs> oh, Siri's doesn't know anything and like doesn't pay attention to a word you say now remember we can't say the Ooh. words no 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 you're fine I've because already... you didn't say i didn't say the, the, but you can't say it yeah because no, I, no. we had comments on the show the last I'm time so we sorry said it. i'm so, so look, sorry we better move on yes and what better way to move Isn't on it ridiculous we can't say a word for yeah, I know. fear that everybody's houses will explode it is completely stupid <laughs> so i'll say words that will cause your brains to explode Kay Jones, what's on your needles? So, what is on my needles today? Well, the first thing is a very exciting new cast on because I finished something and I will talk about that later. It is immense and like so fabulous. I had to cast on another. And it You've is done a- another one of those bookmarks, haven't you? Which bookmark? Do you remember it was a moss stitch? Was it a Mostich bookmark? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was cool. That was cool. What happened to that? I gave it to you, didn't I? No, probably Briny. Oh, yeah. Our daughter Briny, who reads constantly. Uh, she does read constantly. And shall I, shall I just tell you something, right? She was reading a book recently, and she left it on the sofa. She went, oh, Mum, will you bring this upstairs when you come upstairs to bed? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. So she left it on the sofa, and I, it was like one of these teenage rom-com things. So I picked it up and I just I thought, oh, I'll have a little flick through. Let me tell you, it, it was it was like X-rated. And she hadn't got to this section in it yet. And I'm like, what on earth is she reading, right? So I went and looked up this book on Amazon and it was recommended for something like 13 to 17 year olds. I showed it, I came upstairs and I said, look at this. And you read it, you're like, all oh, right, okay, whatever. And I this, go, go. I had no words. Anyway, what is in my bag is a second reading shawl. Because guess what? I finished my first one and it's so fantastic. I can't wait to show you. So I'm going to show you that in what's off my needles. But I loved it so much that I thought I've just got to immediately cast on another one. And luckily, I've got a daughter who loves to read. And, you know, she's reaching that 
stage in her life where, you know, in a year's time, we're going to be thinking about, fingers crossed, her going off to university. And I just thought this might be a, a really nice thing for her to take with her because she can use it kind of as a, like a blanket because it's so ginormous. But also she loves to read. So, you know, she can wrap it around her and think of mum and that'll be lovely, won't it? So, yes, I've cast on another and I'm so excited. Now, this one, I actually asked her what colours she wanted. So she chose, for the sort of coloured stripes, she chose purples, blues and greens. So like a sequence of those running through. And then for the contrast colour, now this is where it all sort of became a bit unstuck. For the contrast colour, she asked for like a really, really pale yellow. And I was like, hmm, not sure how that will look with the other colours she's asked for, but I'll go with it. That's what she wants. So I dyed up some yarn because I didn't have anything in my stash. So I, I dyed up some yarn and I showed it to her and she didn't like it. It, it was, it did come out quite a bit brighter than I expected. I used the lit, littlest amount of gold ochre, Jacquard gold ochre, and it just came out a colour that I did not expect. I kept a little bit of it because actually what I did was I over dyed it and I'll show you that in a second. But I kept a little bit of the colour to show you. So if I show you, can you just see how it's, it is a pale lemony colour, but it's quite a, not neon, but it's really quite bright. And she wasn't keen on it when I showed it to her, but I thought, I said, you know what? I'll just start knitting it into the shawl and we'll see what it looks like. Well, I started knitting it in and it looked awful. <laughs> and I showed it her again. I said, look, this is just not working, this colour. I said, what about a different colour? And I said, I know you really like purples. So what about a really, really, really pale sort of silvery lilac? And she liked the idea of that. So I said, right, okay. So I went away and dyed some more and I'll show you that. But what I did when I dyed up that colour was I thought I'm going to over dye this yarn because I had quite a lot of it. I thought I can't waste it. So I'm just going to over dye it. So I over dyed it with gunmetal from Jacquard. And this is how it came out. And I think it's lovely. Mm. So look at that. Now you can see it's got that slight yellowy undertone. But Dan thought it looked like um, washed out denim. And doesn't it? So now I've got a quantity of this colour for if I want to make yet another reading shawl in the future because what I've paired it up with in a bag down there is a whole um, advent calendar of yarns from Sherry Iris that I got a couple of years ago that I've been waiting for something special to knit with them. And Sherry's colours are very gentle and delicate. So, and they range through sort of pinks, blues, greens, so I thought this would look perfect with them. So I've got another kit, if you like, down there set aside for a reading shawl. So let me show you where I'm up to on the second one. But here we go. Oh, isn't it lovely? So can you see that really gentle silvery lilac, which is this one here, look. Isn't it lovely? Just gorgeous. So I dyed this one and it, it looks perfect. So I started out this one can you see this brownie colour here? Can you remember I made Bryony's boyfriend some fingerless mitts earlier this year sometime? Well, this is the yarn that I used and I said to her, oh, what if, I know you want purples and blues and greens, but what if I started it off at the top with that yarn? Because what I got was I got leftovers from the mitts, but I'd also got another skein of the same colourway but it was slightly different. It had some purples in it. I thought, brilliant, I'll hold them together. So that's what I did. So it's this sort of brownie colour, but there are some hints of a purple in there. So I started it off with that. And this, these were from Pixie Yarns. So most of my coloured sections in this one are Pixie Yarns, and I'm gonna show you some of them in a minute. But I didn't quite have enough and some of the colours weren't quite right. So I've added in some others as well. But it's mainly pixie yarns that's going to be the coloured sections. So we started off with that lovely sort of autumnal colour. And then we've got the stripe of the contrast. And then we've got this gorgeous purple. 
And this is a combination of quite a deep purple, fairly solid mini. And I held it together with one that I dyed up that was a Harry Potter colourway called, it wasn't Di Diagon Alley, it was the other alley, Nocturne. It was Nocturne Alley. And I think that just looks really lovely. And now I'm into another contrast section. So isn't it just gonna be gorgeous? It's gonna be so autumnal looking. So my next two colours are these two purples. These two are pixie yarns and look at those. Aren't they lovely? Just gorgeous. I've paired them up, you can see I've just tied them together. So those two are gonna be the next one. And then in this bag, I've got all of the other colours. So we've got purples in there, a bit of sort of red, to sort of go with the purples and then we've got greens and we've got blues so I think it's just going to be lovely and I love the contrast the contrast is the same base that I'm using for my favorite blanket but this one's got sparkling and I said to Bryony because I had some 100 gram skeins of this in my undyed stash and I said is it okay if if it's got a bit of sparkling and she was fine with that so this you won't be able to see but this one does have sparkling and to dye this, I went so delicate with this because I did not want to mess this one up like I'd messed up the first one. I used, I actually used in the end, a teeny speck of um, a black from Landscape Dyes, which was Kura Wong. I like their black. It's, it's a proper true black. A tiny speck of that to give like a little hint of silver I know it sounds weird that you would put black in to get silver, but it works. And then a little tiny bit of jacquard purple. And that's what created this gorgeous silvery sort of lavender colour. So I am happily knitting away on another reading shawl. And I think it's just going to be so lovely. Now, I have written this pattern up. And it is currently in testing. It's just literally gone into testing. It's a big shawl. I mean, you'll see when I show you the finished one, it's a big shawl. So likely the testing will take a little bit of time, but I, I will hopefully get this released in plenty of time for kind of advent calendar season this year. So it's gonna be sort of maybe October, November time that the pattern will come out, which is perfect time really, isn't it, for starting to knit a lovely, big, comforting shawl. Lovely. Yeah, so loving it. Dan Jones. Yes. What's on your needles? Some people might go on roller coasters. Some people might jump out of aeroplanes. Some people might climb really high mountains to get a rush. What I like to do is do a Latvian braid whilst being filmed. <laughs> Is that what you were doing? That's one of the best rushes I've ever had <laughs> in my life. Right now, I'm like, <laughs> everything's going. You're a brave, brave knitter. <laughs> oh, yes. Ladies and gentlemen, I've really fought, uh, do you know what? I've definitely fallen back in love with knitting small projects. And when I say that, it's a love-hate relationship because I'm not very good at it. And I think that's the reason why I pushed into the bigger projects because once you're off you're off and you're knitting for ages and then also as well I do have that sort of stress when it comes to finding things that I want to knit. I've realised now that I have to do small projects because if I do small projects a number of things will happen. The first one is I'll do more cast-ons and I do tend to, I'm getting better at cast-ons already because I've cast on more small things in the last few weeks than I have in a long time. So I'm getting better at cast-ons. And I actually think, if you recall, if you've been a, a, a viewer for a while, you'll have seen quite a few times me talking about Mobiusing things. And I have a feeling that I was ripping stuff out I hadn't actually Mobiused. I think that I was joining in the round. I was knitting, well, I know, I was knitting across the first needle. I was looking back at the gap. And I think I was doing it right because I think you've got to knit a round or two before it starts to really take shape and... Yeah, you can tell more easily. I mean, I, if you're experienced, you can tell on that first round if, you can. you've, if you've mobiused it. I, equally, could, I could probably tell. But equally, you would need experience to tell if you hadn't as well. Yeah. And so I think that I was looking at it because it does look a bit it, Yeah, it does, it does. 
because I've sort of been missing with a little bit more confidence, knowing I've done it right and thinking, no, no, just carry on. It's, it's going to be fine. So I've got a feeling that there were moments when I was ripping stuff out I didn't need to. And it all comes down to practice at the end of the day. So it the does. more I knit some more mm. things, the better it's going to be. This is the Equinox mitts, which I hadn't knitted on for a while. I picked up about two and a half weeks ago. And I've really been blitzing through this. Because yeah. the last time I showed you this, it was down here. Yeah. So I picked, uh, finished this off, which was great. It's lovely. On the pattern, it said, ask me about carrying on the <laughs> texture. And oh, I did yeah. not ask you. Oh, right. Okay. So, yeah, so I wrote this pattern for Dan for his birthday. And because the, the pattern goes into the decreases at the top... And I wasn't sure if he would fathom how to do that. So that's why I put that. But you did. Yeah. So that's brilliant. And I, I like things like that. Mm. You know, it's what an experienced knitter would find very simple. I don't find it quite so simple. I find it engaging, which is mm. really cool. Mm. It sort of takes away from that mindless stuff, which I never really want to, to have much mm. to do with. But finish that one and then cast on the new one. The new one. Woohoo! Yeah, the second the one. The second one. Cast on the second one. So, bit of lace, and then into the Latvian braid. And I'm just, literally, just start the Latvian braid now. Latvian looks, braids are fun. Oh, it looks lovely, doesn't it? Latvian braids are properly fun. And the yarn I'm using for this is the Merino Yak. It's Regia Merino Yak. Can you say the actual first word it says on the, on the band? No. No. That long word beginning with an S. Yes, yes. So, it's a really fun... <laughs> first word to say yeah also as well try typing that on a review <laughs> so equinox mitts second yeah. one on the go yeah. getting ready to knit into the hand now which is great yeah so all good yeah and it fits perfectly and I, i've never designed an, a full mitten before with you know with a top obviously it's got a top with the decreases here and i really love how rounded the decreases have come out and this hasn't been blocked yet and it fits perfectly it's just got to obviously do the thumb. You're saving the thumbs for last. I'll just do them both. Yeah. At the same time. What else um, right. is on your needles? So I've got a new sock cast on, which is exciting. So I've cast on some red socks because we're in July, aren't we? I know that we're almost out of July, but I do like to do a little bit of Christmas in July if I can. Oh, yes. I really fancied doing just a plain red sock. So I went searching for the perfect red and I, I remembered this colour of yarn. I thought, oh, I think that'll be spot on. So I went and bought a skein and it's the Malabrigo Ultimate Sock, which I've spoken about before. It's a fairly new yarn. It's like Malabrigo Sock, but with nylon. So it's, it's lovely and soft and round and plump and just gorgeous. And I've knit with it before and really enjoyed it. So I got myself a skein of that in Ravelry Red. Now I knew this colour because I've seen it. You know when I've bought Malabrigo before, I've seen this colour. So I thought I'm going to go and get one of those. And it is a perfect Christmas red. Look at that. It's gorgeous. What I decided to do, I've, I've wanted, since I designed my fairground socks, I wanted to try out a modification on the pattern that would make it um, workable to use as a, on a solid yarn. You can absolutely just knit it, the pattern as it is on a solid yarn, and it's perfectly lovely. One of my testers did that actually. But what I wanted to do, because there's movement in the stitch pattern, I wanted to be able to see that movement without using a self-striping yarn. So I've added in some extra detail including a pearl ridge and it's the pearl ridge where you see the movement so here is my sock so far so you can see it's the fairground pattern it should be quite recognizable if you've knit this or seen it but that addition of the pearl bump row the pearl row means that you get that wavy pattern and you can really see it in the sock isn't it lovely so i'm just about to finish the gusset decreases and then I'll just be working down the foot. I did, ha I posted a picture of this on Instagram and I did have a few people message me and ask me what the modification was. And that's a really tricky thing to actually tell you because the pattern is a paid for pattern, obviously. <laughs> yeah, no, that's really funny. 
I, I you know, it's, if it was free, I could just tell you, can I? <laughs> but the the problem is to tell you what modification I've done. I've got to be careful not to tell you what the whole pattern is. Does that make sense? Like, oh, this Coke's really nice. What's the ingredients? Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of difficult for me to tell you what the modifications are. However, what I'm going to do, I'm going to write an article for the Christmas knitability. And I'm thinking I might do it on Christmas socks. So within that article... I'm sure I'll be able to find a way of writing down what the modification is without actually giving away the pattern. So if you've got the pattern and you read my article, you will know what the modification is. Does that make sense? It does make sense. <laughs> so I think that's what I will do. But for now, I'm just going to carry on knitting my lovely festive sock. And I'm using this as bedtime knitting, actually. And normally, Is it working? Well, it is. I've only made one mistake and I did one, you won't be able to see it, but on the, this side of the gusset decreases, I made one decrease when I shouldn't have. So do you know how you decrease every other round? Well, I must have done it on two consecutive rounds because it, I could see it was off slightly, but it doesn't matter, does it? just doesn't matter so I just made up another decrease on the other side to even it off and it's totally fine so yeah I am managing to knit it for bedtime knitting which for me is an achievement because there's pattern in it and normally when it gets to bedtime I just can't do anything where I've got to think remotely but so far this is working so I'm going to keep this as my bedtime knitting it'll take me a while to finish the socks because I only knit generally for about half an hour at bedtime because then I just fall asleep and I'm it's a disaster I'm so bad these days I just fall asleep don't I why are you looking like that no no nothing he's looking like that because he's like laughing at me because he knows it's like... actually 15 minutes <sighs> it's not 15 minutes I know it is it is not the last two nights we've got through almost a whole episode of The Good Wife yeah that's because it's been dramatic yeah and you've been engaged it's with the kept... episode <laughs> it's kept me awake <laughs> So I've been doing better. Uh, that's really <laughs> funny. Do you know what? It's an interesting point that you make about bedtime knitting because it's a fine balance. If I knit, I couldn't do plain knitting at bedtime because I'd be asleep in less than half an hour. I know, you see how you say that. I know. I it's... have to, but I can't do too complex. No. Otherwise, like I couldn't do lace at bedtime. I'd be... Well, this is effectively, there's a bit of it. I've, this is, I mean, I'll show you that's in a second. Quite, you, that's quite involved to be doing at bedtime. It isn't. Oh, okay. All right. It's not. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I, I don't want to cut you off. Okay. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. So, yeah, I mean, it, so far it's working for bedtime knitting. I mean, does anybody else do bedtime knitting? We... If you don't, come and join us. It's marvellous. Not literally in our beds. Although, <laughs> come and join us, you just oh, said. Oh, no. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're all rushing round to come and join us and do bedtime knitting and watch Good Wife, aren't you? I thought you were meaning we didn't actually knit in bed. I'm going, yeah, we do. No, we do. Yeah. You thought I was giving an invitation for people. No, no, no. No, behave. Don't... You're the one who said it. We're not the two Ronnies. What? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Who used to say sort that? Sort the glasses out, Kay. Ooh, we need them back. Behave. Who used to say that? I can't there remember. There was a comedian that used to say that back yeah, the, in the day. Was it Dick Emery? Oh, it might have been. I didn't really like him. Mm, yeah. I didn't, didn't think he was very funny. We need the two Ronnie's glasses back. Yeah, I know. I'm taking my other pair of glasses to have new lenses put in. I'm going to try and get this weekend to get new make lenses sure put in. we don't have... Look, I need to... I will make sure I tell them, do not mess up these lenses like you messed up these ones. We need a long corridor, whatever it, that means. Was it three I don't attempts? Know. No, two. Two attempts. Two attempts, and, and they got it right. But anyway... Yes, so I'll be carrying on knitting my lovely red socks and at some point over the next few months I will hopefully have a completed pair. So in my sort of passion for smaller projects, and I have to keep this up because I'm, I cannot go through this whole pain and rigmarole of challenge with the smaller projects. Right. I don't know what it is, it's like a mental block. Well, so I'm going to make sure that in my rotations, I always have a small project on the yeah. go. Not do 
a few weeks on small, then a few weeks on big. Yeah. Big and smaller. Big and small. <laughs> That's what our daughter Brownie used to call the TV program. The CBBS program. Which was called Big and Small. It was. So I finished one of these socks. Oh, I'll get a blocker. And it fits Briony lovely. She well, was, it she, does, yeah, yeah. I asked her afterwards and she said, yeah, it's fine. I said, are you sure? She said, yeah, it's fine. It just needs a bit of a block. Because there's cables, it, you know, it does pull in Ooh, a bit. Ooh, sucky. Yeah, it's sucky on the leg. But, you know, she got it on. Yeah, and it was... <laughs> that sounds great, doesn't it? <laughs> she got it on. It's Ooh, like me with my running yeah. tights. It's such a lovely pattern. Yeah. And it looks gorgeous when it is spread out like that. It does. That's when it really starts to fly. It's pretty, isn't it? So last time you saw this, I was over here. I was uh, heading Somewhere towards down, the toe. Yeah. yeah. And so finished off the toe, which is lovely, and cast on the next bit. And look. And what I like about this next bit is there's like this sort of sort of transition. It's sort of like going purple to pink. I can see it more. Yeah, I dyed this yarn. I know. And it, it, it is. It's. What? It's cool. Yeah, because I can't remember exactly how I did it, but... The... Makes me think of sweets from the 80s. I don't know why. Yeah. The process involves two, at least two different dye colours, and you dye the yarn one colour, and then you effectively over-dye it with the other colour. And that process means that you see the under colour sometimes. So it's very sort of purpley pink, but such a pretty colour. Do you know what it made me think of? And I really don't know why it did. One of my favourite sweets to eat when I was What else younger. would you do with look the sweet? Look at it, look at it, Kate. One of my favourite sweets to just look at. to admire. Uh, I tell you, fa sweets that you should admire and not eat are York fruits. Do you know what a York fruit is? I do know what a York fruit is. Those jelly things, York isn't fruit. It? You get them at Christmas and you never eat them. Is well, that, that type of thing? I, I think it, it, grandparents get yes. them. At Christmas. And they look like big fruits, don't they? And they look like, you imagine, a sort of fruity burst of an explosion in your mouth. It's just sugar. It's just sugar. And they're coated in sugar, aren't and they? are they? coated in sugar and they're sort of soft in the middle. Yeah. They yeah. are absolutely disgusting, but they're gorgeous to look at. Yeah. So that's a sweet... That's like that marzipan would... fruits, isn't it? That, they're lovely to look at, but, oh, I know, I can't do it. I tell you another thing I that's lovely to look at, but I don't want to eat. Fruit. It's that green stuff that they put on cakes. What's that green? Angelica. Angelica. Yeah, I don't think they really use Angelica. That was a very 80s thing, 70s, 80s thing, wasn't Always it? Always in the baking cupboard when I was young. Yeah, they were triangles, weren't they? My, like diamond. I think... Di you, not triangles, diamond absolutely. shape. You could get them in diamond shape, yeah. but I think you could also get like a big... A lump of a, it. And my mum always, always had a lump of it in the cupboard. Right. And for years, I'm like, oh, can I just have a bit? And she always went, no, no, no. Right. And then one day she went, yeah, okay. Then. It's horrible. Yeah, it is. It's a plant. It's I, an actual plant, Angelica. So she was saying no to me, not because, oh, no, you shouldn't be eating yeah. that. It was, you're not going to like that. No. It's the crystallised fruit. It's like... You know when you get mixed peel, yeah. so it's orange and lemon peel. Yeah. It's the same kind of thing. It's an actual plant that's crystallised. Yeah. I don't, like I said, I don't even know if you can get it these days. The sweet, though, that it totally makes me think of, and I don't know why, is the refresher with the sherbet in the middle. You know, the chewy on the outside. Oh. And it was like full, it was big. Yeah, refreshers. They were called refreshers. Yeah, and so chewy Not on... to be confused with the other refreshers. Yeah, totally different. Yeah. Totally different. Not not the not the hard No, sweets. not the ones in tubes. No. This big chewy thing, and then the middle is like full of like full of sherbet. Full of sherbet. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. Talk about like explosion of. Did anyone flavor. else, when they were young, used to call sherbet kali? No. We did. I know. And we saw it in a sweet shop one time in one of those big jars, and it was called kali. Yes, I think it's old fashioned. K a l i. So yeah. gorgeous, loving it. Cast on the next one. Very pretty. And Brian is very excited about wearing them, which mm. is always lovely. Always lovely. What else is on your needles? So, the last thing... Oh, that... It's not a sock, is it? It's not a sock. Okay. No, no, it's a cowl. And it's my... Oh, I almost said the name. Oh, no, can't do that. Can't do that. It's the next platinum pattern design that will be coming out on the 1st of September. Which will complete the collection within the collection. It will, and... I've knit quite a lot on this. There's randomly a, a needle in there, and I don't know why that's in there, but anyway. I, I've knit quite a lot on this recently, and it just was looking so lovely that I thought I would show you where I'm up to. It's going to be so lovely in autumn. Yes. Seeing you in your full My full, tri outfit. my trilogy Your of trilogy of... 
You're making that word up? No, that's what... My, my dad used to play working men's clubs. Oh, right. And I... <laughs> And he used to take me with him, which was a great education in yeah. how the music business worked. But I remember once... Did you ever see Jane McDonald? We weren't, but we were in Wakefield. Oh, my gosh. So we were in Wakefield, and the concert chairman comes in right. and says, oh, all right, all right, you know, what's your first... Yeah. And my dad says, oh, you know, it, it's this, and shows him the music. Mm. So he goes, oh, that looks interesting. And he walks out on the stage, and he says, and now I'm delighted to introduce... Singing American Triology. <laughs> it is, of course, American Trilogy. Mm. The concert chairman in Wakefield didn't know the word trilogy. Oh, that's Or so maybe he funny. did, but he'd always pronounced it triology. Briley said something the other day completely wrong. Oh, it was one of the questions on Trivial Pursuit, and one of the possible answers was David Niven. Niven. And she said, uh, David Niven. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, to us it was hilarious, but she's like, what's the problem? That's that's what it says. And I'm, I'm sorry, Kate, that is not as funny, and I know we've mentioned this, mentioned this to you before, that Bryony was reading a book, it mentioned the town Chichester, and oh, she yeah. thought it was made up, because it was did. such a cutesy name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was re- It was in Winter Solstice, I yes. think, and the, the town Chichester was mentioned. That doesn't exist, does it? The next does it? day she said to me... Why does it say that about Chichester? That's got to be a made-up town. And I'm no, like, no, it's, it's on, real. It's right down on the south coast. So now every time Chichester comes up on a programme or anything, like Michael Portilla was there recently, and I said, guess where he was, Brian? And she went, was he in Chichester? <laughs> Show us your amazing cow. <laughs> Sorry, yes. Yeah, so here we go. Here's my lovely cow. Ooh, look how much I've done. So yeah, this cowl is inspired, is the third pattern to be inspired by the book The Magic Faraway Tree by Enid Lighton, which is up there. So I'm not going to tell you the name of it. Let's keep a little bit of a surprise. But isn't it lovely? I think last time I showed you it was only down like here and I've done all of this. And it's got some panels of lace and then interspersed by these sort of coloured bands. I'm holding the yarns double, so it's, they're all fingering weight held double. So you could effectively knit it, I suppose, with the DK as well. I've got one, yeah, one, two, three, four. I've got one more mini colour to put in, which is this lovely dark oak colour. And then I'll just be doing the opposite, you know, I'm, I'm sort of effectively, I'm here, I've got to do this much more. So it's actually going to be quite a nice length. And it's just been lovely to knit. Really, really pleasant knitting. It's interesting because it looks simple, but you do kind of have to pay a little bit of attention when you're working the lace. It's not difficult at all. But actually, I do enjoy having projects like this because you've got to concentrate a little bit doing the lace, but then you get to do this lovely garter and stocking stitch band. So you have a bit of a relax, you knit through that, and then you get to do some more lace again. So it's just been really, really nice to knit. So I'm going to carry on and get this finished right up the pattern, and then this will be going out on the 1st of September as the third in this trilogy. It's actually the fourth platinum pattern. So this is the final one for 2023, because then the December platinum pattern is the one that's contained within the advent calendar so effectively that's the first pattern of the new year so yeah once this is all finished I will reveal probably now when the pattern goes out so you'll see this again all finished and blocked and beautiful and I will tell you the name and I'll tell you how that came about it's lovely really enjoying it lovely and squishy I was a bit concerned about running out of yarn but I won't I'm sure because I've got that and there's another bit in there of the main colour I dyed this main colour and then the minis that I'm using were a set from Beehive Yarns lovely Beth and it, they were called Woodland Walk I'd had them for quite a little time in my stash so it's lovely to use them and I'll I'll show you the bits that I'm having that are left after working them into three projects. It's just these little tiny bits. So it uses virtually all of those minis and it'll use pretty much all of those two skeins that I dyed up. So it's worked out really well. 
Right, this year we have been telling the story of the rise and fall of the monasteries and after six episodes of Rise, it's now time to start charting the fall. And we begin at probably, it's certainly the strictest monastic order that I'm aware of, the Carthusians. And it, it really is a most fascinating story because it's a story which encompasses the Hundred Years' War, the Black Death, the start mm. of the Wars of the Roses. So it really does sort of encapsulate so much of the history which you'll sometimes see on the telly, but you'll certainly read about in the books. Mm. And yeah, it is something... It's so funny because this series... I mean, I've been looking forward to this series for years because the, the initial plan was to do this back in 2020, as we spoke about earlier on this year. And it's always been a story that's fascinated me. And the really funny thing is, whilst I've loved everything we've done so far, it's sort of, this is the moment which I feel like I've been waiting for, mm. which is terrible. Because it's not that I want to tell the story of a fall, but I think it's because it's so historically important. Yes. So yeah. let's waffle. And let's really sort of dig into what is absolutely an epic tale as we visit and we meet Thomas and Mount Grace. Fifteen hundred years ago, a way of life arrived in Europe that shaped the development of the world we live in today. Healthcare and education are just two of the many innovations pioneered by the men and women of the monasteries. From the height of their powers at the time of the Normans to their total destruction at the hands of a tyrant king and a cruel emperor. This is one of the most epic stories the world has got to tell and whilst their way of life may have virtually disappeared, Everywhere you look across Europe, you'll find ruined monasteries, echoes of their fascinating existence. And in this series, I'm going to take you to some of my absolute favourites. This is going to be quite an adventure. Welcome to the rise and fall of the monasteries. and fall of the monasteries. You join me just east of Mount Grace Wood. We're in the North York Moors National Park and this is actually a place that we visited twice already this series when we discovered the stories of Revo and also the story of Byland Abbey. 
It's an absolute delight to be back here in the North York Moors because as we discovered in episode one of this series, this was the place, the North York Moors National Park, that my mum first took me and my brothers to to see our very first monastery after we made that first discovery so close to the school that we attended when we were boys. The thing that I love about the North York Moors National Park is it's just so rugged. It's a completely different landscape to where we were last time. We've actually traveled just 27 miles west of Easby Abbey and the foothills of the Yorkshire Dales. And we are about five miles just south of the market town of Stokesley. And we're about seven miles, we're sort of northeast of the market town of North Allerton, where my mum actually grew up. She spent a lot of her formative years in the 1950s. Now, it's an interesting phrase, isn't it, that market town? It's one that I've heard since I was born. I've always been taken to market towns, and people have always talked about market towns. The funny thing is, it's a term which it has absolutely no significance really today, but in medieval times, and even earlier than that, it was really important. Permanent shops were not actually common in England until the 17th century. So everyone bought what they needed from the market. And gaining a charter to actually be a market town, it was a really big deal because you knew then that there couldn't be another market within a day's ride of your town. And also it was a guaranteed money spinner because absolutely everyone came to the market to buy everything that they needed. The days of the market, they were pretty much over by 1948 when the first supermarkets opened. But a thousand years, and even more than a thousand in some cases on, from when those first market charters were awarded, markets still go on in towns to this day. We're not here to talk about markets or even King James I. We're here to visit our final priory of the series. And as you might recall from our visit to Finkel Priory in episode five, priories, they're called such because they're smaller than an abbey. Now an abbey was ruled by an abbot, hence the name abbey. A priory was ruled by the next man down in seniority. He was the prior and so it was called a priory. It's our destination today though that makes this episode so special because after easing you into monastic life with the Benedictines and the Saviniacs and the Cistercians, we're now really sort of going for it with perhaps the most austere and strict monastic order of them all and they're called the Carthusians. They actually began life in the 11th century, much like lots of the other monastic orders, in the hills in France near a place called Grenoble. Their very first monastic house was called the Grand Chartreuse, and if you think that that sounds familiar, you would be absolutely right. The Grand Chartreuse, Chartreuse, it gives its name to an alcoholic drink, and that alcoholic drink, the recipe, it's actually, it's the Carthusians. <laughs> they make the drink. It was given to them in the 17th century, and now any time you drink chartreuse anywhere, it is made by Carthusian monks. And of course, chartreuse, the drink, gives its name to chartreuse, the colour. In today's episode, we'll be uncovering the story of Mount Grace Priory. It was founded in 1398 by a man called Thomas de Hollande, and today it is the best preserved Carthusian priory in all of England. Now, what any monastery needed when it was founded was a rich and powerful patron, and that is exactly what Mount Grace and its monks got in their founder Thomas de Hollande. 
But there was a problem. You see, Thomas was, he was related directly to the current King of England. And he was also an ancestor of three previous Kings of England. So you would have thought that the future was gonna be perfect for Thomas and the monks of Mount Grace Priory. The problem was that things were about to get decidedly sticky for the current King of England, Thomas's relative, and for Thomas himself. Our story begins in 1337 AD. England's king at the time was Edward III, and when the King of France tried to confiscate Edward's property in France, it started a war between the two countries, which would become known by historians as the Hundred Years' War. A defining early moment in that war was the Battle of Cressy in France. King Edward of England led a force of 15,000 men against a French force of 120,000 men. Thanks to the first ever deployment of the longbow, the English were victorious. In 1348, with their lands in France secure, King Edward rewarded his most successful knights with the foundation of the Order of the Garter. To this day, the order still exists and meets regularly at Windsor Castle in London. King Edward's war with France also spelt the end of French being the language of the nobility in England. This was now seen as improper and slowly but surely English became the language of Great Britain. But there was a problem. Within a year of the foundation of the Order of the Garter, the Black Death arrived in England. Travelling by sea on rats and transmitted to humans through infected fleas, in 12 months at least 40% of the population was dead. The most acute and immediate consequence of this dramatic drop in population was a shortage of farm labour and a corresponding rise in wages. Society was now on a path that would lead us to the present day. Power was shifting from the rich landowners to the common man. Into this maelstrom arose a new king. Edward III died in 1377 and was succeeded by his grandson Richard. After the highs of Cressy and the Order of the Garter, the low of the Black Death drove the people of England to crave a strong and powerful king who would lead them back to the good times. The stage was set for King Richard II. And so we are off en route to our wonderful destination of Mount Grace Priory. Now I just want to pause for a minute actually just to sort of touch on the century that we just learned a little bit about because I can't stress to you enough how much England and in fact the world changed in that hundred years. King Edward III was an absolute powerhouse and his victories in those early years of the Hundred Years' War against France really sort of set the, the, the standard for what the country would expect from its kings over the coming years. But he was a man better suited to the battlefield than he was for ruling as a king. Some of the decisions he made and the things that happened in his reign set the whole country on a path to great change. And as we've discovered already in this series, whilst the golden age of the monasteries was kicked off in 1066 with the arrival of William the Conqueror, it was King Edward III and his beginning of the Hundred Years' War that marked the beginning of the end of that golden age. Yeah. 
you can sort of understand it in a way. You've got a Cistercian monastery, for example, that's governed by a house based in France. And that's a country that England is in the middle of a huge war with. So how can we possibly trust anything that that house says to us? Because they're not going to be doing what's best for us. They'll be doing what's best for where they're based, which was France. And then into this volatile situation appears the Black Death. And the Christian church at the time was telling their congregations that illnesses and misfortune only happened to people who did bad deeds. Little did they know that they were actually laying a trap for themselves. You can sort of guess what happened next. Everyone who was suffering from the Black Death turned to the hospitals that were based in the, the monasteries all over England. And so the religious communities of England were hit worse than any other sector. Some historians pessimistically say it was probably 40% of the community that died. And so when you consider what we've just learned, that the Christian church was telling people that it was only sinners who would die from the Black Death, it's not difficult to understand what happened next. Looking back on this now, I find this revelation just fascinating. Growing up, I always thought that the monasteries were closed down because all the monks were drinking, they were probably all married, they were having a great old time whilst everyone else was struggling. As I grew a bit older and read a little bit more, I started to believe that perhaps Henry VIII had made all the sort of you know, the, 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 the bad stuff about the monks and the monasteries up. History is always written by the winners, isn't it? And I thought, what a great way to justify closing them down than to say that they were all sinners. When actually the truth was, they actually laid their own destruction in the messaging that they put out during the Black Death. By them saying that only bad things happen to bad people, well, <laughs> when they all got hit worse than anyone with deaths during the Black Death, what was everyone supposed to think? Of course they all must be sinners. The worst thing though of all is, and what's so particularly ironic is, the only reason why they got hit badly was because the monks were desperately, the monks and the nuns of course, were desperately trying to help people who were suffering from the Black Death. So picture the scene. We've got a country which has probably lost half its population. We've got a war going on in France which has been going on for decades now. And quite frankly, we're not doing very well. The monasteries run pretty much everything from the hospitals to the schools, to the roads, to anything of real importance. But we don't trust them anymore because we think they're all sinners. But we know that we need them. So what possibly could we do? Turn to the strictest and possibly most devout monastic order in existence. They were called the Carthusians and they were founded in 1084 by a monk called Bruno. After considering the Cistercian order, Bruno decided to venture out on his own, forming the first Carthusian monastery here in the French Alps. Bruno and his six initial followers believed that the only true monastic way was that of a hermit and strict austerity, so they formed their first community at Grand Chartreuse with no intention of it spreading any further. The strict austerity did not appeal to many, but slowly, the Carthusian order began to take form. Houses for monks and nuns started to appear and with their hair shirts, really stark buildings and devout religious ways 
this was most certainly monasticism at its most sort of intense and strictest. Now, in England, up until the Black Death, there had only been two Carthusian houses that had formed. But in the years that followed, because faith had literally been lost in the Benedictines and the Cistercians and really all of the established houses, seven houses in the years following the Black Death appeared all across England. So who was it who founded this first charter house in the North York Moors of England? Well, it was Thomas de Hollande, half-brother to the new King Richard II. Now Thomas had seen and taken part in some of the greatest battles in the Hundred Years' War, those first sort of battles that took place. And in his early 20s, his exploits on the battlefield were so famous that he became a Knight of the Garter. He was made a Knight of the Garter in 1375. In 1377, when his half-brother, King Richard II, became king, Richard himself was only 10 years old and Thomas was 17 years his senior. So Thomas became one of Richard II's most trusted advisors. Given the state of the country at the time, I don't think anyone could have been successful. We had, you know, we're in the heart of the Hundred Years' War very much. We've just come off the successes of King Edward III, and the country now with a new king expects a strong and powerful leader who's going to lead them to more victories against the enemy that is France. But unfortunately, King Richard II, he was just not up to the task. Crisis followed crisis, and things rose to a head when Richard himself, he started arresting anyone that he thought was a danger to him. And his actions at the time, now they've been looked at by historians, you know, recently, and they think there's a reason for this. His behavior seems very much someone that was suffering from a really sort of intense personality disorder. At the heart of all of this, was Thomas de Hollande and desperate for a respite and probably hoping to secure his legacy, he chose this moment in 1397 to found the Priory at Mount Grace. And my goodness, what a wonderful spot he chose. Welcome everyone to the guest house here at Mount Grace Priory. Yes, the Carthusians may have lived as hermits, but they still lived by Matthew chapter 35, verse 25. And if I was to turn up here 
in 1399 when the doors first opened and I was to ask for lodgings, they would have been absolutely thrilled to see me and they would have put me up in this rather special guest house. Now, you may have already noticed that things are a little bit different here at a Carthusian charter house. And everything that you would expect to see here is absolutely here, but it's just all laid out a little bit differently. And there's also some really special little extras that we've just not seen anywhere and we wouldn't see anywhere else because the Carthusians were so different. So let's take a little tour of this wonderful place and find out a little bit more about how the Carthusians lived. Like all Carthusian charter houses, Mount Grace is separated up into three distinct areas, each separated by a large stone wall. The first area is the Great Cloister, which was the home of the monks who lived here as hermits. The second area is the Lesser Cloister, which was home to the lay brothers. And the third was the Inner Court, where guests would be welcomed and the lay brothers worked. It is to that second area, the home of the lay brothers, that we shall turn first. Because here at Mount Grace and at all chart houses, the lay brothers take on an absolutely vital part of the community, more so than any other monastic house in the world. And that's because the monks themselves were barely ever seen. They barely ever came out from their own special area, which we'll see later on in the episode. The lay brothers though, operated in a way very much like servants, but because of the devout nature of the community that they were supporting, many of the people who came to be lay brothers in a Carthusian monastery came from really rich and wealthy families because the job was seen as so honorable. With an honorable job comes a pretty nice private place to live. Let's go take a look at where they actually laid down their head at night after a hard day supporting the workings of Mount Grace Priory. Welcome everyone to the Lesser Cloister. Now, the name tells you what it would have been like to walk through this when the Priory was at its heyday. There would have been a covered walkway going all the way around this, allowing the lay brothers, because this, this, it was the lay brothers who lived here, and it allowed them to move from either the Great Cloister, which we'll see later on in today's episode, or the Inner Court. Now, it would have been a bustling community, actually, with people coming and going at all hours of the day and night, actually, supporting the, the workings and the runnings of the Priory. And the buildings that I'm walking along here was actually where the lay brothers lived. Now, not much remained, but enough does to get a sort of tantalizing idea on what life must have been like here for the men doing all the manual work. Let's go take a look. Welcome everyone to what's known today by archaeologists as Cell 16 at Mount Grace Priory. This would have been private accommodation for one lay brother. And within this space, there would have actually been three rooms. There would have been a living room, there would have been a corridor, that's counted as a room, I'm afraid, in what is a very small house. And there would also have been a bedroom. But you did have a private garden. And when you think about the types of accommodation that we've seen in all the abbeys that we've visited so far in this series, this really is quite luxurious. Coming out of the house, we could have turned right and headed up towards the Great Cloister, which we're gonna do later on in the episode. We've actually turned left and we're heading down towards the inner court. This is the place that the lay community would have spent a huge amount of their time. It might be welcoming guests in the guest house, which we visited earlier on the episode, or they might be making their way to the brew house, the stables, or also the granary. Now, you might think that me mentioning a brew house sounds quite strange in a monastery. Why would they be brewing beer? Well, the answer is, some historians will tell you that they drank beer because the water was just highly unpleasant and 
you know, people didn't want to drink it because they knew that they would get ill. That's just simply not true. People didn't really think that deeply into it. If you were poor, then you would absolutely drink water. The reason why people drank beer is they had no idea it was bad for you. They actually thought it was healthy and nutritious. And this is where the first stage of the brewing process, but also the process of making the Abbey's bread would actually happen because this was the granary. And what we can see behind me is actually a kiln. Thankfully for us, the north wall of the granary remains to its complete height. And as we look down it, we can see where each floor once lay. Those sockets in the wall would have held the floor joists. On each floor, there would probably have been stacks of grain held in sacks prior to it being dried in the kiln, which was once positioned here. Now, the inner court was very much the buffer zone between the outside world and the monks who lived in the great cloister. Visitors would regularly arrive here, and as we've seen, they'd be put up in the guest house, but they often came on horses. And so they needed a place to put their horses. And also sometimes the prior did actually leave the, 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 the priory to go away on priory business. And so he also needed a horse. So the final place I want to show you in the inner court is the stables. Now, not too much remains of what was once a really great space. The, the wall to my right is completely gone and actually beyond that wall, there was more of the houses for the lay brothers, but we're walking through what was once the stables where the horses were kept. On the floor above, there was a hayloft and on the floor below was the stalls where the horses were kept. Whilst there isn't too much to see here, the archeological work that has been done tells us that this was a stone building separated apart by wooden walls, effectively creating the stalls for each horse. There would have been at least two permanent residents, the horse of the prior and his second in command. The rest of the spaces were filled up with the horses of the guests staying in the guest house. My favorite part of the stables though, is this groove in the wall. Mysterious, don't you think? That is until I tell you that this was where the horse's feeder tray, known as the manger, once was held. I don't know about you, but I can just imagine the prior's trusty steed chewing on his dinner. But what of the prior and his monks? We've taken a look at three quarters of the priory site and we've yet to actually discover anything about the Carthusian monks themselves. That's because they were living a virtually secluded life in a part of the priory known as the Great Cloister. I'm stood outside the prior's house in the great cloister at Mount Grace Priory. And this was once quite the property. You can tell so because of the oriel window that we've just had a look at. Now, once the prior would have lived in there, would have been his private cell. And up on the second floor, that wonderful oriel window would have given him an absolutely panoramic view of the great cloister, the gardens, and all that lied beyond. Carthusian cloisters were twice the size of anything we've seen so far this series. The gardens would have been used to grow herbs for use in the hospital and of course the kitchen. At 
the centre of it once stood an octagonal water tower, built in stone not long after the Priory opened, but now lost to history. The man who had empowered all of this must have felt some pride, mustn't he? About seeing this wonderful place come into being. As society was turning against the established monastic houses of the Benedictines and also the Cistercians, Thomas de Hollande, half-brother to King Richard II, had helped the Carthusians gain a foothold in England. Surely their future was bright for Thomas, King Richard, and indeed the monks of Mount Grace. Except it wasn't. In 1399, when the first monks started moving in here, Richard II was actually deposed by his own cousin, a man who would go on to become known as King Henry IV. And by the turn of the century, by 1400, Richard II and Thomas de Hollande were dead. They'd been executed. That spelt trouble for the monks of Mount Grace Priory. What on earth would they do? When we come back in part two, we'll find out and we'll explore the rest of this absolutely fascinating place. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you later on in the show for more Rise and Fall of the Monasteries. What a fascinating place. What blows my mind about sites like that is, it's all there. Everything that you expect is there. It's just in a different spot. Mm. So, you know, you'll turn a corner and you'll find a refectory and you're like, oh, didn't expect this mm. here. Mm. It's just so cool, I think, when you take, it's like, a change, it's, it's not a change as good as a rest. I don't mean it like that, but it like sort of throws a different slant on the whole. And that probably is what their idea was. It feels to me more like a little village rather than... It's a, a little a, collection of Yeah, houses. rather than a grand, huge church yeah. that people live in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it just such a, a sort of captivating spot because of the height as you'll have caught there mm. the walk down into it really is quite steep it is and it was deliberately you know there was much more trees around there when it was built and so it was much more secluded but what was clever about it was it's very close to one of the main roads mm. built by the Romans so you could get close and then you had to work a bit to get actually up to the site. So mm. really well positioned. And what was absolutely fascinating when I was there was there was frogs everywhere. Gosh, right. That's, I spoke br that's brilliant, isn't it? I spoke to the people in the house and they said that th they're migrating from one spot to another. Oh, right. So they're trying to get through and they actually come through the site. Right. Which is just crazy. They, they were like everywhere, all in the wood as well. Gosh. And I just didn't expect it at all. No, it was, no, no. No, that's brilliant. Cute, cute little frogs, not like not great like big toads. Great big toads. <laughs> yeah. I've got nothing against toads. They're just not as cute, are they, no. as little frogs? <laughs> We've only just begun, though. Oh. Yo, yeah, well, that's the one you'll have to teach me to sing. Dan's going to teach me to sing at some point. I've always longed... Well, at some point soon. Yeah, I've always longed to be able to sing and... Dan's going to teach me. So. The reason why I stop there for a moment is I have a great love of Karen Carpenter. Yes. And he's going to teach me a Carpenter song, but you've yeah. just not decided which one. The, the, she's just like... Oh, angel. The Voice of an angel. A, and and, and the, the, the drumming skills yeah. of, of a demon. I mean, for you, it's like... Just a perfect like, combination. Go listen to We've Only Just Begun. Uh, go listen to some of the phrasing. I studied this when I was at music college. The, the, the musical phrasing which she uses, it, it, you try and sing along with it, and trust me, you'll run out of breath. Mm. And I don't mean by a few words. I mean by mm, mm. a paragraph. Mm. <laughs> Just st stupendous. Mm. Brian, sure? When the carpenters come on, Brian always says, you're not going to start crying, are you, Dad? <laughs> It's such a tragic story. The thing is, I'm her never, life is such a tragic story. I'm never know? crying about the tragedy of her life. I'm crying about the tragedy of the... Well, it's not the tragedy. I'm crying about the beauty of the music. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yes. But it's just so sad that 
you know, our life was as it as it was. You know, it was, it was just such a waste, isn't it? Look, <sighs> that's just part one. Because yes. in part two, we're going to really delve into some amazing stuff. Mm. We're going to explore the Great Cloister, and we're going to show you a little secret sat in plain sight, mm, mm. right in the middle of Mount Grace Priory. Yep. And trust me, do not miss part You're two. You're going to love it. Right now, though, it's time to find out. Kay Jones, what's off your needles? Well, I promised earlier, and I'm going to show it to you. So yes, my reading shawl is off my needles. And it's just wonderful, is all I can say. So yeah, it's big. It's impossible to show. I'm going to wrap it around and then I'll stand up and then you'll be able to see at the back. You might not even be able to see the bottom of the shawl. It's so huge. But I just thought if I wrap it around, I'll show you why I wanted to create this. Oh, look how wonderful. Let me just stand up and if I turn around, I don't know if you'll see. Oh, oh, it nearly fell. Can you see the back of the shawl? And yeah, how, how yeah, long yeah, it is? pretty much. Hopefully you can see it. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, this is why I wanted to create this massive shawl. So, I mean, you can do whatever you want with it, you know, but my idea was that it was just gonna be this huge, squishy, oh, just comforting thing to wrap around when I'm reading of an evening or whenever you're reading. It doesn't have to be in an evening, obviously, you know, whenever you fancy getting snuggled up and to read. Isn't it fantastic? It's just, it just came out exactly how I wanted it, which is amazing because I kind of winged it, you know, in terms what's, of... What's really surprising about it is it actually looks really quite elegant. Does it? Yeah. Oh, well, that's good, isn't it? You know, I've, I took... I say I chose these colours, but I used an advent calendar from Pixie Yarn for the coloured stripes. And then I placed them into a rough kind of rainbow order, just because I knew that would be pleasing to look at. So yeah, this one is quite bold and bright in the colours, but then you could see from the one I'm knitting for Bryony how you can adapt it to whatever your colour palette is. And it's just fantastic. So I used, all together, it, it weighs 800 grams. But you're only knitting, effectively, half of that because the yarn's held double. So you're knitting through, effectively, 400 grams because it's, you know, it's double. And That was excellent, Kate. Thank you. And that was a terrible dis way Thank you for all of that. describing it, wasn't it? It's just an awful way of describing it. But this is all I had left from... 24 mini skeins and four 100 gram skeins of the contrast colour. So that's all that was left in that little bag. So, I mean, that's really good, I think, that you don't have a huge amount of leftovers and you can just create something just so fantastic. So look, yes, I did a Pico bind off. Can you see that? And... Yeah, I know that Pico bind-offs are not everybody's cup of tea, but you don't have to do it. You can just do a normal knitted bind-off and have a plain edge if you wanted to do that. Not a problem. But I just wanted to add just an extra little flourish at the end. And, OK, it took a bit of time, but you know what? You know, I was doing it and I was thinking, well, if I wasn't doing this, I'd be knitting something else, wouldn't I? For me... So it's just knitting, isn't it? The perfect comparison is this. Beans on toast is fast and it's delicious. Yeah. But beef bourguignon... Okay. No. Oh, I'd rather have beans on toast. Oh, shut no. up. Sorry. Well, okay, so <laughs> so don't bother with the pico bind-off because it, it, it's not worth putting in effort. Well, say, like, chicken chasseur instead. No. Okay. It's not 1982. Well, you said beef bourguignon. I feel like chicken You tonight. said beef bourguignon, you which made is 1982. beef bourguignon. It took 28 years. Oh, don't and even. And Bryony said it was the most delicious it's thing true. she'd ever eaten in her life. I did do it. I filmed it on, on something for the show. Yes, you did. For the show. And everyone knows. It's, a, it's linked it, in the show notes. I, I made the Julia Child's beef bourguignon and uh, it... It was mind-blowing. It was fabulous. Yes, so the point it took is forever. But the point is, 
like life, the more you put in, the more you get out. Oh, absolutely. It was delicious. Yes. It was completely delicious. And really, it was worth the effort. But you, you've got to set your day aside if you want to make that. But Just like a Pico bind-off. Just like a Pico bind-off. You have to set a day aside, but yeah, it's worth it. I think it's worth it because for me, it just adds that little finishing touch. And it kind of gives it a slightly sort of i don't know victoriana feel somehow i don't know maybe that's just my vivid imagination a plain bind off um, is not memorable a pico bind off is yeah and i i think it's worth the effort and like i said whether you're, you're not going to do it on every project you ever make well no of course not you're going to pick but whether you're knitting a pico bind off on this or whether you're knitting a pair of socks you're knitting at the end of the day aren't yeah, you yeah. it's all knitting yeah. so it's just a mindset and the more I did it, the more I was stretching it out and going, oh, this is just absolutely what I wanted. Chicken chasseur. I like chicken chasseur. I can't remember the last time I had it, but it's very delicious. I'll pick some up, honey. Chicken tonight. Oh, not chicken tonight. Gosh, I mean, did you ever use that? Do you feel like chicken tonight? Do they still make chicken tonight? I don't know. I don't think that, they do. I bet they do. Hopefully they've gone bust. No, I bet they do. I bet, I bet they still make Don Mio as well. Did you ever use... Well, Don Mio's a brand. They don't make it. What do you mean? Don Mio is the brand. I know. But they, it's like a sauce for bolognese, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, there's lots of different types, though. Oh, right. Okay. Well, whatever. I used to occasionally use it. That's okay. I've got more time for Don Mio than I do chicken tonight. I've never used chicken tonight. I you didn't, said you I had asked, chicken chasseur. I made it. I bet you didn't. Right, okay. <laughs> anyway, go on. Carry on with your shawl. Speak to him later. Yes. So, yeah, it's all done. And isn't it lovely? And I love it. And I can't wait for Bryony to have hers. And I have used this. I, I have taken some photos of this. Just kind of holding photos for the pattern. Just so I could get the pattern into testing. But I do want to take some photos of it being used as a reading shawl if you like but yeah i'm i'm waffling now aren't i dan's laughing at me because well, I'm, 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 I'm waffling photos being used as a reading shawl as opposed to as a cooking shawl <laughs> or a walking the dog shawl well you could walk you could, could walk, of course you could you could walk the dog with yes it. yeah if you wanted to it's beautiful it looks gorgeous yeah the design i think is tremendously elegant which is a surprise because i don't think sh a lot of times shawls don't look elegant to me. Well, I didn't knit it to be elegant. I, I know you didn't. I, I knit it for a practical purpose and to in, just enjoy... And it just so happens that when it. you slung it on and stood up, it looked elegant and you could go out in it. Right, OK. So well, that's, that's cool, isn't it? Is. It is. I think it's the size. Yes, it's huge. I mean, it is, it is huge, but that is exactly what I wanted. I've never knit a shawl as huge. And it looks surprisingly light. Yeah, I mean it's eight hundred grams, which is a good a good amount. But once it's on you, I don't. I, don't I think feel it, the this does not look bulky. No, it's not. And quite well, often really with a shawl, it can sometimes. I think because it's like wrapped around. Probably because there's so much of it, it's like encompassing your whole body. I know it's yes. fabulous. Anyway, I need a book. Yes. I need to just sit in my chair and like read a book because it's nice and cool today. I could actually just sit and read a book, but no, I need to take some more photos before it, it gets into proper usage. So yes, it's like I said, it's just gone into testing and I'll just I'll keep you posted as to when it'll be coming out. Wonderful. Yay. Right. The moment has come for us to return to Mount Grace Priory and for us to explore the Great Cloister. And trust me, it was worth the wait. Let's head back for part two of the Rise and Fall of the Monasteries. everyone to the rise and fall of the monasteries. We are exploring the wonderful charter house of Mount Grace Priory. And when you left me, the Priory's founder, Thomas de Holland, had just been executed. 
Now in medieval England, this created a serious problem. It was highly likely without a rich patron that your lands would be confiscated and given to the king. What you needed was someone important and wealthy with the ear of the king who could secure your future. Now what most probably saved this monastery was the fact that it was a Carthusian charter house and people wanted to see them successful. And the wonderful thing for Mount Grace Priory was history was about to repeat itself. The new King of England was Henry IV. His rise to the throne would begin what is known today as the Wars of the Roses. Essentially, this was a family squabble between cousins about who had the right to be King of England. Henry IV was a great supporter of monastic life and he specifically wanted to support the growth of Carthusian houses. So he turned to his half-brother, a man called Thomas Beaufort, and he asked him to take Mount Grace under his wing. Thomas took to his job with great gusto and he's actually known to this day as the saviour of Mount Grace Priory. The majority of what we see today built in stone was done so because of Thomas Beaufort. Neil, we've had a good look at the Priory and we've learned an awful lot about what was going on outside of this great cloister. The question was, what was it that the monks were actually up to within the sort of main part of the monastery? Let's go and have a look in one of their private cells to find out. Welcome everyone to one of the 17 cells that was occupied by the monks here at Mount Grace Priory. Now I say cell, it makes it sound like a prison. It sort of wasn't because once here there stood a two-story house. On the ground floor there was actually three rooms. There was a living room, there was a chapel and there was a bedroom and then there was a corridor down one side that ran along the garden and then a walkway straight down into the garden. It really was quite a lovely place. You can just sort of imagine this, you know, and upstairs there would have been a really large work room where you could go and get on with your work. And you know, if you think about it, a property like this now actually sounds quite appealing because it really does take up quite a nice little bit of space. My favourite part though of this monk's cell was the garden. All along to my left here would have been herbs and flowers and lots of wonderful things. There's one thing though that you might have noticed that's missing from what we've seen so far at Mount Grace Priory and that is of course a river. Everywhere we visited so far had a fresh water source because all monasteries needed water flowing through the site to water their gardens and their crops and also to flush their loos. And at Mount Grace, they had a particularly cunning solution. We're approaching one of at least three tapped freshwater springs that once were found around the Priory. This spring fed the water tower in the centre of the Great Cloister, which in turn fed the pipes which ran fresh water to each of the monk's cells around the Priory site. What an absolutely brilliant solution to a really challenging problem in the Middle Ages. Good quality running water, absolutely vital for a healthy site. Now it's been wonderful, hasn't it, to walk around this ruin of the monk's cell and discover a little bit about what was going on here. But we don't have to use our imaginations here at Mount Grace Priory because in the 19th century, archeologists at the time decided to make a reconstruction of one of these cells. So shall we go take a look at one of these gorgeous places in all their glory? And while we do it, let's discover a little bit more about what the monks actually did here at Mount Grace Priory. We've made our way into the cell reconstruction and we start our tour in the monk's bedroom. Each cell was in effect a private monastery with all the elements within it, 
empowering monastic life for one occupant. We're making our way through to the living room. This is where the monk would have eaten. We'll see how he was provided with food a little later. Fusion monks met for the same amount of services as was we discovered in episode four of this series. So it was the same as the Cistercians and the Benedictines and the Savignacs. The difference was they only met twice a day for services together. The rest took place here in their private chapels. Time they spent here in their workroom. Excavations show many trades were practiced. Thomas Goldwyn, for example, once lived at Mount Grace, and he was a weaver, so he brought with him his loom when he moved here from London. Other monks' trades included bookbinders and manuscript copiers. garden is exactly as you would imagine so unbelievably tranquil and you can just imagine a monk pottering around in this garden taking care of his herbs or growing vegetables for him to eat at his table there is though one thing which does really stand out and it's really poignant that this is here because these walls it's a lovely space but they do feel high and they do feel like you really are secluded and enclosed. And enclosed is perhaps the feeling that I'm getting the most from this space. So whilst it is just lovely, it does feel a little bit like a prison. With all this seclusion does come some luxury though, because at the end of the garden, we find the monk's very own private loo. It's spectacular to see that reconstruction. Well, the reconstruction of the whole place, to be honest, not just the loo. And whilst it's 19th century, it's been done, you know, to the absolute tip-top archaeological knowledge of even today, changes have been made. Now, we've discovered how Carthusian monks spent 90% of their time because it was here, but two questions remain for me. The first is how did they eat? Well, they met every Sunday as a community to eat in their refectory. For the other six days a week, they were brought food once a day by a lay brother, but they weren't allowed to see anyone, so it was passed to them through this L-shaped hatch. You can imagine how pleased they must have been as they reached in to pick up their dinner. Here's the hatch on the other side which the lay brother would have passed food through. As we leave that wonderful reconstruction behind, we're actually going to walk by loads more of those food hatches in each of the cells as we walk around. And you can just imagine the lay brother, similar probably to what it's like with hospital food when they bring them around without the heated trolleys, of course, passing them through and then the monk on the inside taking the food and taking it into his living room and having some lovely tea. But what was it that he was eating? Well, by 1400, the diet of many of the houses that we have visited so far in this series had already got quite lax. They were eating more and more meat and they were just bending the rules. The Carthusians were extremely strict in their approach and they stuck to the original principles set out by the very first hermits that they based their life on. People like St Anthony, the very first, they, well many people claim he's the very first person to go and live as a monk in Egypt. 
Archaeological exploration in the kitchens has shown that the only food that was prepared in the kitchen at Mount Grace Priory was vegetables, fish and seal. They did consider seals as seafood. They came out of the sea, so clearly back then they didn't really think more deeply as to what actually they were. And rather wonderfully, the Priory's original fish ponds still remain. So if you were living here around 1400, your diet would have been vegetables, fish and seal. Lovely. <laughs> So the first question that was on my mind was how did they eat? And we've, we've answered that. The other question though is when they did come out of their cells, which was very rarely, and when they did, they would have been walking down covered aisles within their cloister, just like we've seen at all the other places that we visited in this series. But where on earth were they going? Every Sunday they would meet here in the chapter house. Just like every other monastic order, they would meet here to make plans, discuss happy business, and also administer any justice. And at the end of every meeting, just like most of the monastic orders that we visited, the meeting ended with a reading from the rule of St. Benedict. Now the Carthusians actually lived by their own rules which they call statutes and it just goes to show you how valued and how powerful the words of St Benedict were that even here at a Carthusian priory at a chapter house they still finished their meetings in their chapter with a reading from the rule of St Benedict. There is one thing here at Mount Grace Priory that I've never seen anywhere else. And this is it, it's the Priory Prison. Now, there's a number of men in history books who are listed as being residents here, but there's one who really stands out for me, and that's William Everton, who was kept locked up here. And you can see the cells actually, and I mean, they do look like prison cells, but he was locked up here due to his weakness for women. <laughs> you have to wonder, don't you, how on earth was he meeting them? I mean, we've seen, haven't we? Secluded cells, massive walls, virtually never coming out. When on earth would you find time to meet a woman? <laughs> Perhaps it's a case of if you know the right people, you can always make things happen. Interesting thing with William is they actually moved him from house to house in the hope that he would eventually mend his wicked ways. I wonder if he ever did. <laughs> It's actually fascinating to walk through this because I have never seen a prison before in a monastery. It seems that once you were a Carthusian, you were always a Carthusian. There is, of course, one more place where the monks of Mount Grace Priory visited, and they visited there twice a day, and that was, of course, the Priory Church. first thing you'll notice about this church is how small it is. Because the monks performed the majority of the services in their own private chapels in their cells, there was no need for a big church. But twice a day, the lay brothers would have come in through that door behind me for two services a day. The church would have felt very similar to the ones that we visited previously in the series, except this one was much more austere. The wooden screens which separated up the different parts of the church were much more plain, not really carved at all. 
But in 1425, some of those screens were replaced to build a wonderful tower, all paid for by Thomas Beaufort. And my goodness, that tower really is quite special. As we pan up the wonderful tower, you might notice the lines in the external walls. They actually mark the three stages of its construction. Each of those lines was once the roof, and as the tower got taller, the roofs became floors, which could be accessed by a spiral staircase. The top of the tower was the belfry, with beautiful transomed windows. Finally, we make our way into the part of the church used by the monks. Twice a day, they would meet right here for matins and vespers. Wooden stalls would have lined either side of the choir, and in front of me, underneath the east window, would have been the high altar. But something truly wonderful does remain here in the church at Mount Grace Priory, and that is the man who empowered the building of the majority of this, in stone at least. And that is Thomas Beaufort, whose tomb is right here. That, I'm sure you'll agree, is the perfect place to end our visit to Mount Grace Priory and the Carthusians. This is a story which marked the beginning of the end of the monasteries, thanks to the Black Death and the Hundred Years' War. But it's also the moment many aspects of modern British life started to take shape, the language we speak today being the most striking. And it was all set against the backdrop of this absolutely spectacular building. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time for more Rise and Fall of the Monasteries. What a story! Oh my goodness, you can totally see why I was excited about this, can't you? There's so much to go at. I mean, just the Black Death itself, you could do episodes and episodes mm -hmm. about. And one thing I didn't cover in the episode was, do you remember how in episode five we learnt a little bit about the Mongols and about their postal routes mm -hmm. that they developed, the first really sort of advanced postal routes? Well, historians now think that the Black Death spread along those postal routes. Right. So it was transported along Gosh. the postal routes. It then yeah. crossed the sea on the rats and just... Well, I think, you know, from the realities of the last few years, we can we all understand how viruses spread, absolutely. Yeah. You know, you just can't stop them. You can't. I'm so, telling you what, I'm thankful that well, COVID... Well, absolutely be thankful that it wasn't the, the Black Death again because, well, we'd all be in a different situation, wouldn't we? We would. Yeah, the beaky things are just terrifying, aren't they, that they used to yeah, wear? That wasn't me trying to scare you. No, they, they in, used in to wear In part one, those. that is what doctors wore. They thought that that would keep them away from the patients that they were treating. The distance. Yes. And, you know, they're probably right, aren't they? Well, I'm sure yeah. it probably helped a little bit, but yeah, I'm guessing yeah, if the they, person sneezed, you probably were still in trouble. I'd, I'd, I'd guess so. And, you know, they wouldn't have had, had antibac gel and <laughs> things that we have, so... Or anything, really. Or anything, just yeah. some herbs <laughs> from the garden. What about the garden of the reconstruction? Wasn't it lovely? I could have lived in that garden. I just thought it was beautiful. And if you rebuild all of them, suddenly it becomes what Kay was talking about, mm. which is it's a village. It's mm. a walled mm. village. And whilst I said while I was in there that it felt enclosed, if I was to take you back, and we've touched on this a little bit in the series, the world was a dangerous place outside of the protective walls of a city or the protective mm, walls mm. of a monastery 
because the, the, the animal situation was substantially more mm. concerning, but also there was n- no police. And so, you know, you're traveling from one place to another. There's every chance that you're going to get abducted and robbed by mm. brigands. It was a rough old place, you know, rough old world, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, everywhere was, you know, things are so different now mm. to what they were. What a great start to the beginning of the end. And next episode, it's the sort of... Some people would say it's the jewel in the crown... Some would. ...of the monasteries of England. We'll have to try and guess. All will be revealed in episode eight. That's coming out on the 25th of August, because next time, oh yes, my favourite blanket is back. It is. It's the start of the decreases, baby. It is, and I've um, trialled the the dye colour, and it's... It's fantastic, and we're, we're very much moving into that sort of autumn phase. So, yeah. wonderful, lovely. Right now, though, it's time for the endy bits. Endy bits. Self striping yarn cal is coming in September. Yes, we've got a knit along coming in September, as Dan's just blurted out. We thought we would run a self striping knit along for everyone, everyone out there, anyone can join in. And it's going to run just through September. So it's going to be the self-striping September. I just think that would be so much fun. Everything you wear in September has to be self-striping. Yes. Yes. So whilst you are knitting your self-striping item... Pictures can be shared at. Yes. You've got to wear stripy socks. You've got to have a stripy top. Oh, I'm already there. Maybe stripy trousers, hat. Wear as many stripy things as you possibly can whilst knitting something stripy. Beautiful. We're joking, of course. I'm not joking. <laughs> Prizes will be awarded. <laughs> For the most stripy person. It's true, though. Knitting their striped thing. Yes. So, I mean, inevitably, it'll probably be the majority of people will knit socks. But you don't have to. But it's got to be a self-striping yarn. So, you know, it could be a hat. It could be mitts. It could be socks. I won't say, I mean, it could be a garment, but generally you wouldn't use a self-striping yarn for that. Maybe you've got a DK self-striping, in which case you could. But yeah, it's self-striping, knits along through the whole of September for everyone. So we will have a few prizes. The purpose of it really is just to have a bit of fun. It's, you know, it's the start of autumn. It's, oh, it's a lovely time for me. I'm very happy to get into September. And I know there are a lot of people out there who feel the same. So it's a little celebration of getting to September. We can knit loads of socks. I know we, everybody, oh, a lot of you out there, love knitting socks. And because I've been working with a lot of self-striping recently from a fairground pattern, it just sort of made me want to knit more and more self-striping yarn. So I've collected a nice little hoard of it. So I'll definitely be knitting some stripy socks as well. So I've got a few prizes that I'll be awarding. And also, as well as these three prizes, there will be, I think there's two skeins of yarn from Freckled Whimsy. Carrie very kindly said she would donate two skeins of yarn to our knit along. So she's just going to send those direct to the winner. But I do have some prizes here as well. When I was working my fairground socks, I purchased some yarn yarn for it from Fab Funky Fibres. She's a dyer here in this country. And when she, when she sent me my order, she added in two of the skeins and she just said, do whatever you want with them. So I was like, gosh, wow, thank you so much. So these will be two prizes. So we've got two sock sets and there's there's two 50 grams here, which are the striping element and then a 20 gram mini. So this one is walking on rainbows, gorgeous. And this one is never going to give you up. That sounds like a very posh way of saying the song, doesn't it? And again, it's split into two 50 grams for the stripes and then a 20 gram mini. So I've got those two sock sets. And then I had a very kind donation from a viewer of a little yarn that I've never seen this before. But she bought two of these and wanted to pass one of them on as a prize. And it's from, it's like a Sauber ball. So it's Shoppel, Shoppel wool. Is that the name of the company? So it's like a Sauber ball, but it's in minis. I've never seen this before. So it's 100 grams, but it's split into what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's an unusual number, isn't it? 
into seven different colours. How fun is that from Shopple? So we've got that as well as a prize. So it's not self-striping, but you could stripe it, couldn't you, yourself? I've got those three prizes. And then, like I said, Carrie at Freckled Whimsy is also going to send two prizes. So we'll have five all together to be awarded for the self-striping cow. So that'll be starting, like I said, 1st of September. And we just thought we'd mention it now so that you can gather all your stripy yarn if you want to join in. And the great thing is, if you're a Baker Bear patron and you don't finish, if you cast on socks for the self-striping cow and you yeah. don't finish, you could just roll them straight over into Sockerween. You could absolutely. Which yeah. is our next big patron event coming in October. Yes. I mean, we always allow whips generally. I can't, yes. I can't think when we haven't. So yes, whips will be allowed. So if you've got some stripy socks on the go at the minute that you don't think you'll get finished, yes, whips will definitely be allowed. Yeah, and you don't have to finish your item as well we generally like to say that if we can don't have to finish it it's just really for the joy of joining in so as long as you post a picture before the end of september in the thread that'll be on ravelry if you want to join in with that then you'll qualify for a prize our next patron only show is coming on the 30th of july at 2 p.m british summer time yeah. you can watch last month's show which was particularly popular because we had a bumper ask the bears section we did uh, you can watch yeah. that at the link it's that's in the show notes below so we broadcast a live show every month yeah. and last month was hijacked by a ginormous ask the bears we had so many questions we might need to do a couple more yeah. this yeah. episode so. and actually i might throw it open again because you guys enjoyed it so much if there's any more questions that you wanted to ask do feel free because if we're going to pop in another short section yeah. we could answer another couple more questions mm. too if you've got questions you want to ask so that's coming on the 30th of july and yep. it'll be shared via our patreon page in the usual way full details on how to access the show will be published at the beginning of next week yeah do you have anything else i've just got one other thing i wanted to show you this because i just think it's so fantastic so when i purchase my dies it's the landscape dies i purchase them from a company that's actually based in the village where Dan and I had one of our first dates. Can you believe that? The company's called Wingham Woolworks and it's based in Wentworth in Rotherham. It's a gorgeous village actually. And I always purchase mine from there. It's a brilliant service. And what they've started doing recently is part, part of what they sell, they sell a lot of fibre because they during the sort of process of that they have like little bits left over and they've started using that fiber as packaging for everything that's sold so the last couple of times i purchased dyes it's come packaged in fiber so i've started collecting it i don't spin I've, you know i've never spun yarn in my life but i couldn't get rid of this because this one in particular is so beautiful look what they do they card it how amazing is this and then they use it as packaging because they said it's just a sort of byproduct of part of their business. And it's, you know, it's an eco way of producing packaging. But how fantastic is that? It feels like nothing on earth. It's like, oh, it's so fantastic. It's super soft. I've no idea what the fibre is. But I thought, you know what? I'm going to start just collecting this. And it might be that in the future when I've got a, a, a big bag of it, you know, I'll just throw it open to say if there's any spinners out there. Probably I'll say in the UK, just to keep costs down. Then I'll just send it to you because I, I've got no use for it, unfortunately. So I just wanted to show you that to make you aware of, of this company because the, the, they've got an excellent service. They do other things as well. Like I said, they do fibre. I think they've got some yarn, I'm not sure. But I always, I use them for the dyes. So, yeah. Cool. Right, that's it, folks. Thank you so much for watching. Summer of Stitching is still yeah. in full flow. The bag making course is about to start. Yes. It's coming, I think, the first, oh, it's about the 4th of August, around right. then, maybe the 1st of August. Partway through the Beach Days cross stitch at the moment, which is amazing fun. So still lots going on with the Summer yeah. of Stitching. Our knitability editor, Jen, she had a review that's just gone out this week, a yeah. Summer of Stitching review, and then there's another one coming as well in August too. So loads of fun things going yes. on, as always, for our patron community yeah. but for now though that's it so thank you so much for watching thanks everybody and we'll see you in two weeks for our next video show which yeah. will of course feature my favorite blanket see you soon bye, bye. Enthusiasm's not
quitting for and keep the bakery pears. They'll take you to fabulous places of which they're in a castle watching the bakery bears. It never feels like a hassle to sit and watch the bakery bears. What's on your shelf or what's in